um, for your word and for Damien. And Lord, we thank you this morning as we submit ourselves to your word once again that you have something to say to us. You have something to impart to us. You have some things you, you want us to adjust. You have some things you want to remove. You have some things you want to add. And simply, Lord, me included this morning to say, have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Speak truth, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Cool. So I have uh, um, been talking from Philippians. I'm in Philippians. That's where I'm, I'm dwelling over this season. And maybe I'm preaching more to me than to you, but you're the benefactors stroke have to put up with it um, because as God works through me, I believe He works through you. And I've said a number of things in introduction. Number one, cling to Christ. Cling to Christ. Uh, Philippians 1.20, no matter what. Turn to your friend and say, no matter what. I'll continue to hope and passionately cling to Christ so that He would be openly revealed through me before everyone's eyes. And so I will not be ashamed in my life or in death. Christ will be magnified in me. You can lose many things. You can lose your reputation. Oh, good to see you. Um, you can lose your reputation. You can lose your cool. You can lose weight. You can lose your job. You can lose. But what you cannot afford to lose is Christ. You have to cling to Christ. Christ is everything. Christ really is everything. And we've been talking in Philippians about leaving, cleaving, and becoming one with Christ. You have to hold on to Christ. And when you do that, Christ is revealed through you, and Christ is magnified in you. Isn't that amazing? What you cling to is revealed through you, but it's also magnified. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And Christ in Paul's life here in Philippians, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I know God doesn't get bigger, but in our view, He's magnified. So um, number one, turn to your friends and say, cling to Christ. You can lose face, you can lose your pride, you can lose your reputation. It's all okay as long as you cling to Christ. Cling to Christ. Number two, He's very passionate about you. This is just a, a little introduction and overview. We spoke about the scripture that, uh, that uh, His disciples remembered about Jesus, that zeal for His house will consume Him. And we said, remember, Jesus is not, it's not a legalistic, religious person. He's relational. Before the law came, God loved, and God engaged with Abraham through faith. And so this scripture is not about God being uh, uh, religious, about a building or a system. It's His house is His people, living stones like you and me. And God is actually passionately in love with you. So turn to your friend and say, God is passionately in love with you. You can't allow yourself to think other, uh, different to that. That's the truth. And uh, God doesn't love us for what we can do for Him. God doesn't love us because there's some value He discovers in us as He loves us. God loves us because God is love. Does it make sense? And so the third thing uh, as an introduction um, that I said about Philippians is that you have a responsibility then to respond to this love of God by keeping your passion and love for God boiling hot. Romans 12 verse 11. Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord. It's one thing to say, Lord, I love you, but our love is shown in our service to God. Make sense? So keep your enthusiasm serving the Lord, keeping your passion towards Him boiling hot. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let Him fill you with excitement as you serve Him. There's a responsibility for me to not allow things to get in the way of me and God. He loves me passionately. I'm clinging to Him. But it is possible for things to get in the way and for me to drift away. For me to fall away. And for me to turn away from God. And remember, even in the deserts, you can have one of two responses. You can become hard towards God, or it can be a beautiful softening 
of love towards God. Um, Song of Song, chapter 8, I don't know the verse, but it, it, it speaks about this, this lady who has a picture of the king and then going hard after the king. That's Song of Songs. And in chapter 8, it talks about who is this leaning on a lover coming up out of the desert. It's an amazing picture. She's leaning more on, on him coming out of the desert. It's a beautiful thing. Then there is Hebrews that says, don't harden your heart as you did during the time of testing in the wilderness. The wilderness can either make your heart hard or it can make you lean on him even more. Amen? And so it's my responsibility. It's amazing when Jesus walks among the churches in Revelation chapter uh, 1 and 2. It's amazing he doesn't say like, Yo, your building's looking shabby. Your worship, the band is not, the music's not sounding so great. The thing he points out is your love has grown cold. Love has grown cold. It's my job to keep my passion for Jesus boiling hot. Amen. Yeah, and I, like I said to you, I'm probably speaking to me as much as you because just doing the work of God is no guarantee that my passion for God remains in place. So the two questions I'm asking as I read Philippians. Number one, what does passion then look like? If we look at Jesus, we look at Paul in Philippians, what does passion look like? Because a lot of people think it's like outward you know, it's how much noise you make on the outside. And uh, if, you, <laughs> if you're born again in the Pentecostal time, it's like, yo, if you're not loud, and hallelujah, praise God, that's passion, you know. Amen, brother, sister. It's like, it doesn't mean if you're outwardly expressing it. That there's this deep inward passion for God that comes from the inside and works its way out. And so what does that passion look like? And... Um, I've said, if you read Philippians chapter 1, for me, passion is expressed in my, I've used this word, determination or perseverance. And remember I said to you that I'm using this picture between my relationship with Jesus the same as in, in marriage. Because you can be married for a long, long time, but you can lose that connection and that love and that passion. And the same with Jesus. And so, for me, Paul is writing this letter, Philippians, from prison. And I want to say that God has never given up on mankind. Do you know that His love for mankind has never one day dipped and come back up again? It's been the same always. And even when we sinned in Genesis chapter 3, God never gave up on us. He made a plan, and He sacrificed, and He came to remove what stood between us, but He never gave up, because God is love. And 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, love never gives up. And so that's important in a relationship. Because there are many times that you will have the potential and the opportunity to just give up. And so in Philippians chapter 1, Paul is sitting in prison. He's being persecuted. And while he's being persecuted, people are trying to make trouble for him, taking advantage of his weak position, preaching out of selfish ambition. And yet Paul in prison doesn't give up on his passion for Jesus, his passion for the church, and his passion for the gospel. Why? Because God never gave up on him. And so for me, our, a passion is expressed through perseverance. Does that make sense? In Philippians 1. Um, we also asked ourselves this question in Philippians 1. Practically then, how do I keep my passion alive? That's my second question. Does that make sense? So what does passion look like? Perseverance. Come on, don't give up. Not on God, not on the church, not on the gospel. In marriage, don't give up too easily. Passion is expressed through determination 
or perseverance. Are you out there? Well, then how do I keep that passion going? How do I keep that passion going? And you can practice this. There's some very practical things I gave you, Philippians chapter 1. Very, very practical, and I hope you're practicing them. Um, Remember what Paul said in in verse 2, In all my prayer for all of you, I'm full of praise to God, and I give Him thanks with great joy. And we've said praise, um, prayer, and thanksgiving. Try that. Before you settle the argument, pray. Praise. Thanksgiving. It works. Just practice it. Remember that? Very practical. Um, I then said to you also in Philippians 1, faith. Remember uh, in Philippians that famous scripture that says, I'm confident that he who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it. We have to have faith that God is working in this relationship. It's not just an effort from my side to God, but God is working and God is faithful. And so you've got to have faith. You've got to be sharing. Paul says you are sharing. There's a shared responsibility and tender compassion. And then also we've said, well, the practicals is keep growing. Verse 9 to 11. Remember that? I continue to pray that your love will grow. Love grows. If I love this person, I will continue growing personally. And I've often said this, that if, if Renal, me, Jesus, if she gets closer to Jesus and I can get closer to Jesus, not theologically closer, we get close through the blood, but if I go after him and if I cling to him and if I become like him, then actually we get closer to each other. is that amazing? And so church life is exactly the same. If you take hold of Jesus and you and I take hold of Jesus, somehow we are united by our, our relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? And so you have to keep growing. Paul says in, uh, in your revelation, your understanding, in your character, and in this attitude of wanting to please God. Amen. So I hope you're growing. Good. Not just in other ways, but growing up and growing out. And, and then we said, well, very practically, and I, and I say this because I'm not, I'm not going to rush through Philippians. I want us to hang here. And what I don't want to do is just give you notes, give you a great sermon, and we all go back and say, like, that's great. No, I want this to settle. Because honestly, if we do this, We'll serve Jesus for the next 30, 40 years and we'll be red hot when he comes back. Be red hot when he comes back. Amen? If he spares us another 60 years, if we just pray, praise, give thanks in our relationship with him. If we have faith, um, we keep growing, we have this tender compassion. Keep growing. I tell you, we'll be red hot when he comes. You stop growing in your revelation. You stop growing in your character. You lose the fire very quickly. You cut your prayer life out. You stop praising Him. The fire goes out very quickly. Is that all right? So this is not rocket science. This is just as the church. Practice. Practice. It'll give us the endurance to make it in the long haul and stay fresh for Jesus. Amen. And then the last thing I said is focus. And that's where we, we, le- we, we landed last time. I was here. It's amazing. Paul in verse 12 to... I'm talking just through chapter 1. 12 to 21. Paul is not focused on his chains, but he's focused on Jesus. Where you look is where you live. Where you look is where you live. So um, be careful where you look. If you only see the chains, if you only see the restrictions, if you only see the limits, if you only see the problems, the fire will quickly go out. He's not focused on the chains, he's focused on Christ. He's not focused on himself, he's focused on the the gospel moving forward. He's not focused on the pain, he's focusing on how others can be 
encouraged and be emboldened through what he goes. You know that people, people can actually, and the, 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 I just want to say this to you as Christians, as believers. Don't let the world put this on you that you're somehow superhuman. You know that people can be touched by watching us go through difficult times. The thief on the cross only watched Jesus suffering. I don't know if he ever saw a miracle. But he saw the way in which he went through suffering. And it impacted his life enough for him to come to faith. And I don't know if it's because of the prosperity gospel or where we got this. Somehow that Christians don't have problems. Then you're really close to God. Now you're really a good Christian. Do you know what I mean? That you've got everything sorted and God is with you. And you're blessed. You're so blessed. You drive a... Anyway, you're so blessed. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because now you're really a good Christian. Because then we get under pressure to try and be blessed, you know. And we start pretending, no, sometimes I've watched people suffering in such a godly way that it impacts my life forever. And sometimes they've, from a disease or a sickness, they've passed on. They died. God didn't rescue them. But yet I was impacted by their faith. And they, they constantly remained positive. They always praised. They always prayed. They always had this tender compassion towards God. And it's strange but beautiful to see. And I just want to encourage you. To be a Christian is not like we've got everything together. No, we cling to Christ. That's what's the value. Hold on to Him. And so maybe if, you, if you're sitting here today and you're saying, like, you know, I've been through a really, really difficult, challenging time. But somehow I've prayed my way through. I've praised my way through. I've grown in this. And actually my focus is still on Jesus. I want to say, good job. That's the work of God in you. Amen? Amen. And so um, Paul finishes off Philippians chapter 1 in this way. Verse 27, whatever happens, whatever happens, whatever happens, keep living your lives based on the reality of the gospel of Christ. Then when I come to see you or just hear good reports about you, I'll know that you stand united in one spirit, one passion, celebrating together as conquerors of the faith of the gospel. And so that's chapter 1. Marriage has its challenges. And um, Jean even buried Sean under the house one day or something. Wasn't there a rumor like that? <laughs> one Sunday. Anyway, you've got to go see that DVD to know what it means. But... Sometimes we just need to pray through, praise through, keep growing. No God is at work in marriage. And um, it brings glory to God. Amen. So just an encouragement to you. All right. Are you ready? Chapter 2. So chapter 2 changes a bit for me. And I think I want to focus on the second part of this. And I still want to ask these two questions. What does passion look like? Looking at Jesus, looking at Paul in Philippians, what does passion look like? Well, for me, it doesn't give up. Number one. And how to keep that going are those list of practical things. That's chapter one. We move to chapter two, and I'm going to read the passion translation just because that's what we're talking about. Verse one. I'll switch between one or two versions here and there, but let's read verse one in chapter two. Uh, did you start the clock for me? Because I didn't start the clock. No, no, no. I've got uh, Leo's playing golf. <laughs> oh, just uh, we're on a time because it's good for us to come back again and we'll we'll hear the word again. So. Um, and I'm also saving you from other preachers coming in. Uh, I can't ask them to preach to the clock if I don't. So that's, that's, we don't mind. God breaks in. That's cool. So, so verse 1, it says, Look at how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the Anointed One. You are filled to overflowing with His comforting love. And so Paul begins to talk about this wonderful, unconditional love that God shared with us and that somehow through the gospel 
God is passionate about us, so passionate that He hasn't given up on us. He's given us Jesus, and through the blood of Jesus, we can now love God back. And He's saying, you know, in that relationship, from that position, there's a lot of uh, uh, encouragement that flows back into your life. Think of people who don't have their relationship with God right. Just think about this. People that are not in this, in this room or in churches like this who don't know Jesus and face the things they face, where does their encouragement come from? And for us, there's an encouragement that flows back from our relationship with God. There's also this comforting love from God. Isn't that amazing? No matter what you go through, somehow you know God is present. And then he says, you've experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and you felt His tender affection and His mercy. So I'm asking you, my friends, that you be joined together in perfect unity with one heart. Can you say one heart? One passion. And united in one love, walk together with one harmonious purpose, and you will fill my heart with abounding joy. Paul begins to talk about There is a perseverance in the work of God, but there's also something that's happened to us. Remember I said if you get closer to God and I get closer to God, somehow we're closer together. There's a, a unity that, that exists because we have the same Father. We're not working to achieve it. It's happened. You were born into his family, I was born into his family, we were born into his family, and from that we take great encouragement, but we are united. And he now begins to say that, you know what, it's not just about persevering, but it's actually about your attitude as well. And um, if we read verse 3, it says, he, he begins to expound on this a little bit. He says, be free from pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. And again, I want you to think in terms of marriage, and I want you to think in terms of our relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? So it's the, the church's relationship with, with Christ, but it's also, it's got to do with marriage. And he says here, be free from prideful opinions. And in other words, he's saying like when you're married, you leave, you cleave, you become one. We made one. All right? There's already a unity that exists. But now he's saying be careful because there are some things that can break down that unity. And you're going to have to adjust your attitude and your mindset to make sure that those things don't get in the way. And I'm saying to you, for Christians who have served Jesus for many, 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 many years, there is a possibility for things to creep in and actually get in the way of my passion for Jesus. And one of them is that we give up too early. Secondly, is that we don't have the right attitude or mindset towards things. And that's what we're dealing with now. Does that make sense? And he begins to say here, don't allow... You see what he's saying? Be free from. Which means these things will try and attach themselves to you. Then he says, don't allow. This is not kind of what you do. It's what you have to make sure you don't allow. Which means for me, it naturally happens. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your hearts. But in authentic humility, put others first. And view others as more important than yourselves. Now, I've got to talk about this. I've got to talk about this because some people feel that can be abusive. And it can be if it's misunderstood. Okay? I'll get back to that. Verse 4. Abandon every display of selfishness. It's amazing. I love the way abandon. It means like you and selfishness are on the same path, really. And you have to abandon it's not like you, you, don't, you won't have this. You'll have it. You'll have to abandon it. That's why I like the language here. Um, possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. And consider the example 
that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before us. Let this mindset become your motivation. Let this mindset become your motivation. The NLT says you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Now I'm going to qualify some of what I'm saying here. I'm going to qualify it by Paul saying the overall idea is look at the mindset Jesus had. Okay? And so uh, I need to qualify some of these things. And, and we work our way through. The first thing that is addressed here in verse 3 is be free from pride-filled opinions. For they will harm your unity. The quickest way to break down a relationship is to have pride. The quickest way to break up unity is to have pride. Because <laughs> there's different kinds of pride, right? There's stubborn pride. There's self-willed uh, pride. If you go and look at the word pride in the Scriptures and you, re and you search the Scriptures, there's a, there's a stubbornness, there's a willfulness. Then there's an arrogance about pride that, that can exist. Um, for me, I like the way Bob Mumford puts it. Pride is really you want to be right. It sounds very simple, but you want to be right. And by that I mean that often you, you think that your opinion is more important than the other opinion. And you know, you can, we can be like that with God because God shares His Word and we can say, like, Lord, I know you say that, but I think I'm right here. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You, if, if we think about this, we'd probably say, no ways, I'm not that, but... I want to say, if, they, if I don't deal with the pride in my heart, my long-term relationship with Jesus, I will drift. Same thing in marriage. Try it. Hold on to your pride and always try and be right. And let me know how it goes. <laughs> you know what I know is because Proverbs 16, 18, first pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. I know God works against the pride. He sets his face against pride. One of the seven things God hates is pride. So pride, pride is just pride is an overestimation of my own self. Are you doing all right? And so Paul is saying desperately here, you gotta if if you have that mindset, you're gonna struggle in your relationship with Jesus. <laughs> and I think he means in marriage as well. Um, secondly, he says, don't allow self-promotion to hide in your heart. <laughs> Which means you've got to go look for it, because it, it probably is hiding somewhere. Amazing, eh? And Paul says that the quickest way to ruin a relationship is to have my own self-promotion in mind in this, in this thing. And I use my wife... Um, in this way this morning because it's easier for us to understand. <laughs> I'm well aware of the risks. <laughs> it's easy for us to understand because sometimes you see with God, you, you don't recognize self-promotion. You relate to God, but it really is for your own promotion. And self-promotion for me, Bob Mumford uses this phrase, to look good. To be right, to look good. You're very concerned about how you look in the eyes of the other person. And um, that's very unhelpful in the relationship. Amen. I mean, you guys look good. Most of us. <laughs> From what I can see. <laughs> I'm 50 now. You know, the church is not, we're not immune to this. As we go about the work of the king, sometimes we can do things to try and look good. We can try and show how humble we are. Only because we're wanting to look humble. We can pray because of how it makes us look good. We can re I'm just saying, we're not immune to this. It can hide there. We've got to make sure it doesn't hide. You're right. Because long-term relationship with Jesus, you're going to lose your fire. Is that helpful? 
And then he says, abandon every display of selfishness. Two words Bob Mumford uses to describe, I think this is to feel good and personal advantage. To feel good. If the relationship has always got to make me feel good, I think we'll hit a snag. If it always has to be for my personal advantage. So, uh, young people sit down and you, know, you ask them, why, why do you want to get married? Oh, I love him. I love her. And I've always wanted a man who can look after me, provide for me. Do the, I'm like, okay, you, okay. Provide, raise my children, be a role model. And now this list is growing now. Okay, so, so what you want out of the marriage is this. And then the husband said, well, I've always wanted a wife who can... If it's like Alex said, cook briyani for me. No, <laughs> he's downstairs, I'm messing with him. And can do this for me and do that for me and do that for me. So, so the reason you're getting married is not about what you can put in. It really is what you can get out. Now we have a problem because if you're getting married to get something out, and I'm getting married to get something out, we're going to be bankrupt pretty soon. We'll be in overdraft very soon. Actually, it's about what can I... Put in, what can I bring? Amen. And many people serve Jesus like that. Well, I'm in this terrible time, and you know it's a mess. And I, and what I really want Jesus to do for me is to sort this out. Give me a promotion. Give me like sort this out, and then I tell you, after a while, you can't live like that, because He doesn't do everything that I want Him to do. Are you? Are you catching this? So you've got to abandon a little bit of your self-centeredness <laughs> if you want to keep your relationship with God going. If you want the fire to stay alive, you're going to have to let go self being in the middle and at the center. I'm going to qualify some of these things because this one is a difficult one sometimes for Christians to, to understand. Uh, he says, you, 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 I'll read it again. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests, he says. There's a little bit of a distortion because Paul qualifies this and he says, well, just look at the example of Jesus, right? Because if, if I tell you what he's not saying, he's not saying have no interest in your own well-being. In other words, to be a good Christian is not to neglect myself. I'm totally neglecting myself and I'm running around to put everybody else's interests at, 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 uh, um, to meet their interests. You know, I said it very wrong, but anyway, I'm off the camera. And now I'm being such a good Christian because I'm absolutely whacked and ragged and I'm neglected and my, my mental health is, is a problem and my emotional well-being is a... Is, but hey, I'm looking and I'm running after everyone else's interest. That's not what he's saying. Just to qualify. I'm being a bad steward if I'm not looking after myself. Can I hear an amen? You must rest. You must be in a good, healthy space. You need to look after what God's entrusted you because your body doesn't belong to yourself. It actually belongs to Him. So be a good steward. But then he, you see what He does is He puts it in the context of the example of Christ. And Christ didn't come primarily to meet your need and my need. People who preach the gospel like that I think is incorrect. Think about what I said. He primarily came to do the will of the Father. He primarily put God first, and by doing that, He, he served our interests by going to the cross. Does that make sense? It's the joy set before Him. He endured the cross. What was the joy? Yes, to see us saved, but to be at the right hand of the Father, to be back with the Father, restored in, in, in glory, having done the will of the Father. His interest was God first, and from that position to put other people... If it's God first, then God will highlight the interests of others. Does that make sense? I just qualify that because sometimes people think when you preach this, it means like you're just everyone's slave. And is not true. 
If I had to, <clears throat> I'd be dead now. I'm telling you, I'd be dead. If I was running around every day, everyone else's interests, I, I wouldn't be alive. I'm dead serious. I mean, I'm, I mean it. That wasn't a joke. Because you can burn yourself out running after everyone. No, it's, it's the example of Christ means it's God's will for my life first. And out of that, I am, I'm not everything is about my interests. Sometimes it means it's an interest that's not important to me, but it matters to someone else. And that's the mindset and the attitude. Is that clear? Are you okay? I'm glad. If everything is always about your own interests, you know what James says, what causes fights and quarrels? Very simple. They, don't come, they come from your desires that battle within you. You want something, but you can't get it. When you can't get your own way, when you can't get your own way, <laughs> when you want to be right, when you want to look good, very hard to have a relationship. Same with God. It can't always be about my interests. God, I'm serving you because of what you do for me. Stay with us. It can't always be about my interests. Surely you will lose your fire. Amen. All right. Ten more minutes. Ten minutes. You can make it. What Paul says here is, you know what will set your relationship on fire? You know what will set your relationship with God on fire? You know what will break down your relationship? He says this thing of pride, this thing of self-interest. You know, this thing of not, he's saying that will break down. But he says, you know what will put your relationship on fire? Authentic humility. You know, it's set his relationship with God the Father on fire. Because I read this again this morning in Philippians. Man, I was blown away. Jesus Christ, and you remember he, he, in Philippians 2, it's the kenosis of Christ. It's how he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. You know Philippians 2, you should. But it says as he, as he humbled himself and as he was obedient to God, God exalted him to the highest place. What does that mean to you? It means like what Jesus did there meant everything to God the Father. It took his relationship to another level. Because it says, therefore God exalted him. Why? Because he humbled himself and he became obedient. And in that authentic humility, God the Father exalted. God said, this is what I love. This is amazing. I'm exalting you to the highest place, giving you the name above every name. Not just for no reason, because you humbled yourself. You want to set your relationship with God on fire. Authentic humility. Hard to describe that, hard to, hard to define that, but authentic humility means that I find my sense of value not from what I own, not from what I do, not from what I have, but from what God puts on my life. And therefore, if God puts value on my life, God puts that value on someone else's life. And so I can see my horizontal relationship properly because I understand my, did I say that right, vertical relationship? It was impressive. <laughs> my technical terms. Authentic humility. Wow. Authentic humility. Humility is not humility. Oh no. I, I, I know a person, don't laugh when I, when I say this, but when they do something amazing and really helpful, and I say like, jeez, like, thank you. They'll say, it wasn't me, it was God. I was like, okay. So I just saw you do that. So you're God. <laughs> I know what they mean. I know what they mean. Humility is not like, I'm such a worm. I'm terrible. Oh, no, no, no. It's not that. 
Humility is understanding my value comes from God. My value comes from God. Not in what I do, not in what I have, not in my position, not in my skill, not in my ability. My value comes from God. That, that's humility. Why? Because Jesus said he entrusted himself into God's hands on the cross. He knew God loved him. He knew the will of God. And he said, you know, I entrust myself into your spirit. He understood his value came from the Father without him doing a single thing. Is that okay? Authentic humility. Try that in a relationship. Oh, it's attractive. It is. God exalts it. Um, so, what sets your relationship on fire? Authentic humility. Number two, a greater concern for what matters to others than just your own interests. We've said that already. And then considering this example of Jesus Christ. Uh, read verse 6. Sorry, uh, uh, Leo was thinking of golf. He existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to ceasing equality with God as his supreme prize. I was thinking about this, and there's a, I, I apologize that I can't quote the guy. But you know, there is a big difference between wanting to be like God and wanting to be God. One is, is very noble and righteous, and is in our design as humanity, it, it's how God designed us to be, to carry His likeness, to be His mirror image, to reflect Him. To, to be like him, the other is incredibly wicked. It's the root of all sin. You see that? And here is Christ, not the equal to God, didn't consider equality with God something to be his first prize. Do you get that? Wanting to be like God and wanting to be God, two different things. Verse 7, it says, Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. Amazing, eh? He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. Uh, he was a perfect example even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. So it's fantastic as we read this. Um, that's a very challenging mindset to have. Emptying myself of my outward glory for the sake of obedience to the will of God. Humbling myself so God can exalt me. And um, let's stand together, if that's okay. I want to land with this scripture because really for me, the question I asked, um, what does passion look like? Passion is reflected in my attitude. What about my attitude? The attitude, the pride, those things that I spoke about, the true humility. How do I keep that? I do these things. I put the interests of others. I reflect the attitude of Jesus. And then this beautiful verse in verse... 13 of chapter 2 for me is, is a standout. God will continually revitalize you, implanting within you the passion to do what pleases Him. It's an amazing thing. When you change your attitude and you change your mindset, God pours energy into you that, that gives you a passion to do what He wants you to do. You know what I mean? It's a beautiful thing. And I, and I see it reflected in the way that Jesus humbled Himself and God exalted Him. This relationship between God and the, the, the Father and the Son was energized and sparked on fire by Jesus' mindset and Jesus' attitude. That's an example for us. And I believe that if we don't keep our attitude right, if we don't keep saying, Lord, please, I'm abandoning my selfishness. I'm not allowing that thing to live in my heart, that self-promotion. If I keep my mindset right, God will keep igniting the fire so that when He comes back, I'm still on fire for Him. Amen.
And so today, uh, my, my message is just for me. Just enduring, just persevering is not enough on its own. You've got to have the right attitude towards this whole thing. Your will be done, Lord. Your interests first. And if I do that, Lord, even when I serve the interests of other people, I won't burn out, I won't fall out, I won't die, I won't. No, you will revitalize me for passion to serve you, to even carry on serving you. <laughs> you know? I just feel like this morning God wants, to, God wants to promise you the things He's spoken over your life. He's able to pour out that passion and fire for you to do it. For Jesus, there were times where He thought, I can't do this. <laughs> there were times He said, Father, please take this cup from me. But He did it because God strengthened Him because His mindset was right and God revitalized Him to fulfill that purpose. It's a beautiful thing. And so, Lord, this morning, just ignite in us a fire deep inside. Holy Spirit, come beyond our own ability to just say, Lord, I want to work hard for you and do all these things. But no, Lord, it's a mindset and an attitude of just authentic humility. Understanding our values from you. Like Jesus knew, you spoke over him. You are my son with whom I'm well pleased. Before he did a single thing, he understood you valued him. You are absolutely, passionately in love with us today. Your love hasn't diminished. It hasn't changed. And our value from that, our, what unites us is that. It's Christ. It's what we cling to. And so I pray today, Lord, spark the flame in us again. We're sorry, Lord, for when our attitude gets out of hand, when we always try to be right or Try and look good or feel good when we're not vulnerable like we read here. We, we ne we're not vulnerable. We put on a front as if we're so great and so together and so that we can't be vulnerable like Jesus who took on the form of humanity. God himself took on the form of humanity. It's, it's mind-blowing, Lord, that you would be so humble that you would do that for the sake of our interests and the interests of the Father. You're amazing, Jesus. We know we're not wanting to be God. We're wanting to be like you, Lord, because that's what we're destined for, to be conformed into your likeness. <clears throat> and I pray today, Lord, lift off any burdens off us. If we've been through a difficult time and prayer and faith and all these things that's brought us through, make sure, Lord, today I pray that our attitude is one of joyful obedience to Jesus a gratefulness for what you've done and saying, yes, Lord, your will be done, even if it means it does, it's not just our interests, but serving other people's interests, Lord, it, you will revitalize us in that and ignite us again to fulfill your purpose and to be full of fire when Jesus comes back or when you take us home, whenever, whichever comes first, but that we'd be burning hot no matter what we go through in this life, that we'll be burning hot when you come back when we see you face to face, when, when whatever happens, that we'd be burning hot for you, for the gospel, for your church, Lord, for what you've called us to, that we serve you with enthusiasm, Lord, and absolute love and greatness because of what Jesus has done. Be glorified, Lord. We want to please you in every way, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Uh, it is school holiday, so your kids are... You can grab a quick coffee before you fetch them. Have a bit of a jaw. But remember to fetch them downstairs. Have a great, great time. Have an awesome week. Please stay. Don't run off. There are cappuccinos. Filter coffee.